thank you all. The format for this is each of us will take a turn doing about five minutes to give some background and then people will be sending in questions and then we'll have an open panel to answer questions. So this um, current phase of, of policy uh, was due to a lot of work by a lot of people and resulted in the 21st Century's Cure Act which authorized a, a FACA working group at HHS, and a FACA working group um, had a, uh, a charge and oversight through HHS, and their charge uh, in their charter was to look at what was going on in HHS and identify different aspects of the activities related to tick-borne diseases. Importantly, this FACA working group doesn't have a budget or programmatic authority, um, but I think you'll see yet even without a budget or programmatic authority that there were some very good results that came out of this. Um, they have three groups, the first one finished, uh, we're in the middle of the second group and then there'll be a third group each lasting two years. So the first working group, I was the chair of the working group and it was really a remarkable group. Truly one of the charges was that broad representation. I can't tell you how broad it was. Clinicians, patients, patient advocates, public health officials, basic scientists, HHS leaders, some of the people who are in the audience today that represent those different groups. It was really an amazing group of people. And their charter, again, was to review um, HHS activities and really look and find areas of redundancy, which we didn't find that many of, and areas where there were gaps, where we, there could be more work done. And uh, the first working group, the 2018 one that I was on, had different subcommittees. So the charter allows the working group, the FACA group, to have subcommittees. And you see listed the first subcommittees in 2018 and the second group in the current working group 2020 report. And these subcommittees kind of outline what you would expect they would with some, some subtleties. So vectors, pathogenesis, testing and diagnosis, vaccine and therapeutics. In our group, we kind of lumped other tick-borne diseases together into one subcommittee. And then very importantly, we had a very active access to care and support for patients subgroup. And then you can compare that to the subgroups that are in the current uh, FACA group. And they're similar, but, but different. So those subcommittees reported back to the whole group. All the meetings were done in public and they made recommendations. And I think the recommendations we made were, were pretty remarkable. They went into a 110 page report, which you can all read at your leisure on the HHS website. And what was really remarkable that was despite this diversity of people in, in the group, um, the was almost universal unanimity in supporting the need for more research. I mean, almost all the votes were unanimous. When we identified a gap where there was more research needed, the votes were almost always, I think they always were unanimous when it was about a gap and need for more knowledge. So everyone agreed there were gaps and there was need for more knowledge. There were one of the subcommittees, the patient access to care group, didn't always get uh, um, unanimous votes, but passed a lot of things uh, and passed most of their things. And again, it pointed out the difficulties with some of the topics. I'm not going to pretend that the topics were always easy, and that was one that had more difficulty because the challenges in patient access to care are so huge and so real. The report also um, uh, made a recommendation that the NIH um, should develop a strategic plan for tick-borne diseases. Um, we talked about getting the CDC more um, resources for their work. And then one overriding theme throughout the entire group, every subcommittee said there needed to be more education for both clinicians and patients. And this was all done in an open process. And in fact, we emphasized over and over again that everything should be open, that people should be transparent, and believe me, people weren't bashful and it was transparent. So, um, so what's the end result? We issued 28 recommendations in this report. They were used to inform the tick-borne disease going forward. Um, but again, we didn't have programmatic or budgetary activity. And I was first thinking, well, what's really going to be the impact of this report, you know, without a budget? But it turns out, uh, Kristen Honey told me something that she was right. She said, you know, John, this is a way to shine a light on what's needed. And in fact, that's what it's done. It's really sh taken this light and shown it on the gaps where research is needed, what the challenging areas are. And it's really now up to all of us and our representation in Congress and state, federal, and private stakeholders to take this report and use it to advocate for what they think needs to be done. So with that transition, we're going to kind of tell you about different perspectives from other um, aspects of this and what's going on. Great. Thank you. So um, I'm Dr. Sue Visser. Um, I've met many of you actually through the FACO work group, um, so it's really great to see you here. 
Um, I actually flew in on the back of a mosquito um, into the tick-borne disease world. Um, I'm a child development expert. I worked for 16 years um, in Atlanta, where CDC is based um, in child development, specializing in behavior disorders. And when Zika hit, that was sort of the area where vector-borne disease and child development collided. Um, so I was deployed to the Zika response. And I worked on that for a couple of years. And then um, I moved my family of five, um, my three daughters and my husband out to Colorado, um, where I was asked to build out a policy program around tick-borne diseases. And that was just before the tick-borne disease FACA started up. And I had a lot to learn. And you guys are helping me learn a lot more. Um, there are so many questions um, that I still have. But um, first off, I started asking, um, questions of, of all of you, patients and caregivers and doctors, um, psychiatrists, psychologists, immunologists, you know, I just everyone I possibly could to try to learn what were the barriers, what were these gaps in preparation for us moving towards the FACA. And um, after I felt like I heard you, I saw you, I understood the pain, the frustration, the anger, a little bit of hope, um, I felt a little bit better prepared to, to move down this path with Dr. Ben Beard, who served as the official um, representative of CDC on the panel. Um, we surprisingly, very surprisingly, I think, did not have a problem with any one of the recommendations that were made. I, I feel like we all kind of started this process feeling a little trepidatious. You know, what was going to happen? Were we going to be able to work together? Were we going to be able to find some common ground? But we did. and. Um, in order for you to understand a little bit of uh, what my next year and a half um, sort of uh, looked like, um, it's important to understand a few things. Um, first, CDC is a little different in that the way we have our funding allocated, we have it allocated by disease. So for domestic HIV, for example, you heard earlier, um, we receive about $750 million a year for domestic HIV response. Um, we get funding allocated for ADHD and Tourette syndrome, for hepatitis, and for harmful algal blooms, um, all sorts of specific um, diseases and, and issues. So for Lyme disease, we have uh, $12 million allocated per year um, for, to, the, to the CDC. And um, the second thing that you need to understand, um, I think, is that we have something called the Anti-Deficiency Act, which means we may not move what Congress gives to us for a specific issue to some other issue. So we can't just move um, money we receive uh, for HIV or hepatitis to another um, condition. Um, and then the third and final thing to understand is that um, we can't lobby. Federal employees cannot lobby. So um, as much as I might want to like scream from the rafters, we need more money for this issue or that issue, we can't do that. But what we can do is we can educate Congress. So the next three slides here, I'm just going to tell you um, what we've been doing to try to educate Congress um, about the very, very uh, real needs of tick-borne diseases and the great threat of tick-borne diseases here in the United States. And um, I found myself with, uh, armed with an MD and an entomologist um, going and talking to senators and, and congressmen and congresswomen about um, more cases, more germs, more people at risk. The US is not prepared. So you can see very clearly, um, these, this first uh, figure is just the uh, number of reported cases of tick-borne diseases in the United States over time. We know this is about an eighth to a tenth of the overall cases based on our other analyses of claims data. Um, you'll see babesiosis only became nationally notifiable, which is determined by the Council for State and Territorial Epidemiologists in 2011, so that's when you start seeing that. But the difference between 16 and 17 it was, we had a significant difference for every single tick-borne disease. And um, it was the, we now have the largest uh, number of reported tick-borne diseases ever reported to the United States, even with this massive underreporting. So more cases, more cases of Lyme disease. Lyme disease is by far the most common um, vector-borne disease nationally. It's the most common tick-borne disease. And you can see that even focusing in on the Northeast, which we, we know is not the only place that uh, Lyme happens, for sure, um, you see this explosion of cases. And something very interesting is happening in Massachusetts, right? Have they cured Lyme disease? <laughs> <laughs> they have stopped reporting Lyme disease. Um, and they've stopped reporting it because they are so overwhelmed, they cannot keep up with the investigations. So. Um, actually, in 2018, you'll see we probably have a whopping dozen cases that are reported to us. They have just stopped. 
So um, the, um, the number of cases is, is really, really important when considering the burden. But also, more germs. We as, um, Ben, swipe this slide. I'm going to come after you later, Ben. Um, but we have um, six uh, tick-borne diseases, uh, pathogens, germs, that were identified in the past 15 years, plus bourbon virus, which we are all but certain is tick-borne, so seven total. Um, so more cases, more germs, and then more people at risk. The most medically relevant vector that we have in the United States, Ixodes scapularis, um, is expanding geographically. It's pushing north, it's pushing west. Um, ticks that were never, never in Maine are now in Maine, and they are um, voracious. <laughs> Uh, so we now have 49% of U.S. counties, which is a 45% increase um, with Ixodes scapularis or Ixodes pacificus. So this is really, really important. Um, and it's important to note that um, the number of counties with established Ixodes scapularis, which again is the most medically relevant tick we have in the U.S., has more than doubled in the last 20 years. So more cases, more germs, more people at risk. The U.S. is not fully prepared. Um, so we took this message to Congress, and um, over about 18 months, the past 18 months, we conducted 29 congressional briefings. So these are one-on-one -on -one congressional briefings, they're panel briefings, town halls, even a field hearing with Senator Collins and Sara sitting to my left. Um, and one of those in-person briefings that we conducted last year um, was with Sara and uh, her team. And um, she was already interested in tick-borne diseases, but we had a conversation with her about what was needed um, in terms of um, our national response. Um, repeating that mantra and trying to help them understand sort of the situation that we have at hand. Um, I just want to, before I pass it off, just thank you all for, um, for welcoming me. I know that we have a complex relationship, um, me as a representative of CDC, and you all as um, part of the field of, um, of tick-borne disease. Um, I am really grateful that you have welcomed me into that field, and I encourage you to tell me your stories. Um, I promise you that I convey them to others um, in Congress and in other areas of influence, um, and I'm really excited to hear uh, Sara pick up the rest of the story. Hi, good afternoon. It's, it's a pleasure to be here to share with you what Senator Collins is working on to change the page on Lyme disease. And I know that many of you have been working for years and even decades in raising awareness about the disease and working to raise the bar in science and improving prevention, diagnostics, and treatment. And it's on your shoulders that we stand today. And the efforts that I'm going to discuss build on what my colleagues here have already talked about and are really um, all interrelated. In our last panel, we heard about the efforts that have been made with Alzheimer's disease. And 20 years ago, Senator Collins founded the Alzheimer's Disease Task Force in the Senate. As a part of that effort, she authored a series of bills that raise the bar for Alzheimer's disease. One of those bills is the National Alzheimer's Project Act, which determined that we need at least $2 billion to be able to find a cure, means of prevention, and treatment for Alzheimer's by 2025. And this year, in at fiscal year 2019, we've reached the $2.34 billion mark for Alzheimer's disease. Senator Collins aims to do what we did for Alzheimer's with Lyme disease. And that's really the genesis of the Tick Act, which I'll focus on today. In developing the concept for the Tick Act, I reached out to partners across the federal government to learn about what HHS and agencies are already doing. I met with Sue, and she gave me as a, a, my team an in-person briefing, as well as um, was always available to answer phone calls afterwards, and it started a conversation. We carefully read the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group, and we reached out to the authors to learn the backstory and dig deeply into it, learn about what got into the report, what didn't get into the report, and what a national response truly looks like. And we reached out to constituents. Two that I would like to point out, because they've been so critical at every step, are Dr. Kristen Honey, who's here with us today. And she served as the vice chair on the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group. And Paula Jackson Jones, who's not here with us in person, but certainly in spirit. And <laughs> thank you. 
Um, your work and advocacy has really been uh, the, the spirit and the soul of this legislation. And it was through talking with all of you and learning about what we need to do that we developed the legislation. And we introduced it in May of this year to co correspond with Lyme Disease Awareness Month. And the legislation has one big goal, which is to combat the escalating burden of Lyme disease and other tick and vector-borne diseases and disorders. Senator Collins authored this legislation and um, introduced it along with original co-sponsors, Senator Tina Smith from Minnesota and Senator Angus King from Maine. This is truly a bipartisan issue. I've heard over and over again, um, Olivia um, is the one who first shared this quote with me and it stuck with me and I've shared it whenever I do lobby for the Tick Act. <laughs> she said, ticks don't discriminate, um, Republican or Democrat, and that's truly the case. This legislation has is a three-pronged approach to addressing Lyme and other tick-borne diseases. First, it would establish an Office of Oversight and Coordination within the Department of Health and Human Services that would coordinate with other key agencies. We know that Lyme and other tick-borne diseases are widespread and growing and that we need to address them from multiple and complementary lens. So participating in the office would be federal efforts at, um, in addition to HHS, other agencies including Department of Defense, the Department of Agriculture, the Environmental Protection Agency, Department of Interior, and Homeland Security. And with that complementary approach, we can bring together all of the different key agencies that are looking at the problem through different perspectives and put the efforts together and make sure that we coordinate them to truly address Lyme and other tick-borne diseases. The office would be tasked with developing a national strategy that would be updated annually. And this strategy would contain actionable items that various agencies would then be able to take on. And many of you may have seen that uh, just uh, uh, last week, I believe, the NIH came out with the uh, strategic plan, research plan to address tick-borne diseases. That is a very encouraging step and will be one critical part of this national strategy. The office would also be responsible for expanding research, improving prevention, diagnostics, treatment, and testing. The second prong of the TIC Act, and um, I'm just realizing that perhaps I forgot to mention what the TIC Act stand for. It stands for <laughs> Ticks Identify, Control, and Knockout Act. And that's our goal. The second piece would be uh, to support regional centers of excellence in vector-borne disease. Sue shared her story about how she came to tick-borne diseases initially from her work on mosquitoes. And um, the story of the Centers of Excellence in Vector-Borne Diseases also started with mosquitoes. In response to Zika, Congress provided an emergency supplemental funding of $48 million to stand up these centers. And since three out of four vector-borne diseases in the United States are tick-borne diseases, these centers naturally have turned to addressing tick-borne diseases and have done a lot of the foundational work and even discovering new tick species that could carry new and deadly threats. So our legislation would reauthorize funding for these centers and put in statute that they must study ticks as well. It would reauthorize them at $10 million um, each year for the next five years. And uh, these centers are responsible for surveillance prevention and outbreak response and really serving as academic research hubs for moving the, our understanding forward. The third prong of the TIC Act is grants to states. Our goal is not just for us to better understand tick-borne diseases and answer research questions theoretically, but our goal is to get that to communities, to get it to patients, to families, and to people across the country. So th these grants to states would be authorized at $20 million for each of the next five years, and they would help to build a national public-private public partnerships with national support providing local resources to states and communities so that once we do have better diagnostic tools, they can make it into communities and to physicians as quickly as possible so that when we do have treatment, 
that that treatment can also make it to patients. And another big priority that we heard from patients is not only about treatment, but making sure that that treatment is accessible, making sure that it's affordable. And that's another critical part of um, the legislation and what the grants would help to ensure. So that, in a nutshell, is what the TIC Act does. And next, I'd like to share with you its prognosis and um, how you can help. So every piece of legislation goes through a complex process of sausage making before it gets signed into law. And most bills don't get signed into law. But this is one that Senator Collins is determined to ensure that we do get to the president's desk. And one key step is to hold a hearing on the legislation. So that's what Sue mentioned. We held a hearing last month in Maine, and CDC uh, Dr. Peterson came to testify. And we also had um, Paula Jackson Jones testify, and another patient shared their experience as well as a physician. And this brought to the limelight on a cong uh, congressional conversation on Lyme disease and really put pressure to move the legislation forward. And that's our goal now. We're working to get the bill marked up by the Committee of Jurisdiction, the HELP Committee, Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. And we're hopeful that that can happen as soon as uh, this season. But in order to make that a reality, we need more co-sponsors. So um, here on the map, the lime green stars represent states that have co-sponsors. And we hope that by the end of the conference, it'll be covered in lime green. So far, of course, we have um, we worked with Senator Smith from Minnesota and Senator King in introducing the legislation. And recently, we picked up co-sponsors, including Senator Blumenthal from Connecticut and Senator Capito from West Virginia. And I know that folks um, here traveled from all across the country and would love if you could um, make a pitch to your member of Congress to support the TIC Act. It's really your work that has put the TIC Act, that has put the need for a national coordinated public health response to Lyme disease in the limelight. And I believe that it's going to be your efforts that's going to get the TIC Act signed into law. Thank you. So I'm Holly Ahern. Um, I know some of you in the audience. Um, I am a professor of microbiology at a small college upstate that nobody's ever heard of. Um, I'm also uh, an advocate in addition to being a scientist. And I, as, a, as part of that role, I uh, co-founded a 501c3 organization where our primary uh, goal is advocacy and also education. I'm scientific advisor of another organization and uh, our focus is to come up with a diagnostic test, and get it, make it available to people as quickly as possible. And you know, I'm here today as a kind of in that scientist advocate role, but also as a mom whose daughter, the reason I'm here is because I was recruited by a tick that bit my daughter and started her on an odyssey that it took several years to recover from. So I sort of have, this is my overall perspective on the national response to Lyme disease so far. So looking at that, you know, I, I have to say, well, you know, Lyme disease is, is bad, but what is it, is it worthy of mounting a huge national response uh, to this one disease? And the answer is yes. So when you look at the numbers, uh, you know, Sue did mention that there is a, a underreporting, only one in 10 cases get reported. That was, uh, came out publicly in 2013. At that point, it was reported that there are over 30, or 300,000 new cases of Lyme disease in the U.S. That has been the narrative for, since 2013. And so when you see uh, even press releases coming from you know, our, our government, it, they always quote that, 300,000 new cases. But when I you go look at the data, which by the way, the data is publicly available, so if you go actually look at that data, in 2017, um, and hopefully the 2018 data will become available soon, there were 427,430 new cases, which is a 37% increase in the number of cases of Lyme disease in the past four years. So when you put the numbers together and you look at all the other 80 infectious diseases that the CDC tracks, they do surveillance on, and you look at all those other diseases, 
you know, number, Lyme disease is often referred to as the, um, you know, the fastest growing vector-borne disease. It's the number one tick-borne disease in terms of cases. It's the number one vector-borne disease, and that includes mosquitoes, fleas, and all other vectors of diseases. And overall, it's the number three infectious disease in terms of the number of new cases per year. It's number three. Number one is chlamydia. Number two is gonorrhea. Number three is Lyme disease. And I am not an epidemiologist, but from an epidemiological perspective, I just have to ask, doesn't that raise questions how a disease that's supposed to be very hard to catch um, has managed to make it to the point that it is the third most common infectious disease in the country? And there's more to it than that, um, just to bring up the elephant in the room. Um, and that is the issue that of those cases, of those new cases, what has been conceded is that 10 to 20 percent of those cases go on to develop this thing called post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. And that is early cases. So th those are people who were diagnosed early and treated within a window where treatment success is 80 to 90 percent. But I want to point out what that means is if we started today using the numbers that are available, there are starting today for those people who will end up with a chronic debilitating illness this year that's 86,000 people who will become disabled as a result of Lyme disease you multiply that by five five years starting from today that's a half a million people in 10 years that's a million people who will be disabled as a result of this bacterial infection that's a lot of people so the elephant in the room is an indication that this is a disease that really requires more time and attention, particularly when it comes to the issues that were pointed out, the gaps that were noted in the tick-borne disease working group. I was a member of the testing di and diagnostic subcommittee of that group. Um, we were able, you know, our, we all agreed, we did certainly come to consensus, and the consensus was the current testing for Lyme disease is not clinically accurate and we need more testing. We need better testing, we need research, we need funding for, for research to identify a new diagnostic test. And that's for the early form. So then the, the real elephant in the room is the fact that if you are not diagnosed early and not treated within a, a treatment window of somewhere between you know 50 to 60 days, the bacteria spread to places, they establish permanent colonies, all of this is being shown by the science. Realize that that 10 to 20 percent, you know, the post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome refers specifically to those people who are early diagnosed within that window of time where antibiotic treatment does seem to be effective for the majority of patients. But for people like my daughter, for people like Julia Brazizi, for people like Olivia Goodrow, for many of you in this room, that diagnosis did not occur. So the diagnosis didn't happen at the time of, of the tick bite. Months went by, then years, and by the time it was diagnosed, it, the treatment becomes much more difficult. Those numbers are not reflected in that 10 to 20 percent. So how many more people are we actually talking about? And that, you know, when I did the statistic of there's 86,000 people starting today who will become chronically ill, that doesn't include any of those. So what is needed? Well, you know, the, the gaps that were identified in the tick-borne disease working group, prevention strategies are obviously failing since we have a 37% increase in the number of Lyme disease cases since 2013. Diagnostic testing is not clinically accurate. That means it, it, a positive or negative test doesn't really give a physician an actionable um, something to do. Spirochetes that are remarkable microbes um, that are capable of things that bacteria are not supposed to be capable of. That research is being done now. The research that should have been done 30 years ago is being done now, thankfully. But what we're finding is that they tolerate antibiotics. That's different than resistance, by the way. They tolerate, meaning you could put them in a vat of antibiotics and they're just like, eh, I'm fine. I'll form into a, a form that doesn't need to breathe, eat, breathe, or reproduce. I'll just wait until the antibiotics are no longer there. We know they impair the immune system. 
And the, you know, Dr. Robinson earlier said that the response that people have to infection is variable from person to person to person. So there's no one size fits all Lyme disease. And the last point that I really want to make is that there is truly an unmet need to publicly fund innovative and translational research. Meaning I appreciate, you know, the, there's $150 million in the TIC Act that's going to be uh, available for very good things, but we need another $100 million that should go to basic research. NIH needs to fund research that will, is currently being funded privately. So all of the things you've heard here today, all of the major breakthroughs, all of the, the science that's leading the way has been privately funded by organizations like the Cohen Foundation, like Global Lyme Alliance, like the Bay Area Lyme Foundation, like Focus on Lyme. That's where the real results are coming from. So NIA should be embarrassed. I would be embarrassed uh, to say all the good research is being done by patients that you are paying for, which is on one hand a very good thing, but on the other hand, it has to stop. And I also want to point out that Lyme disease, of all the tick-borne diseases, the emphasis is always on tick-borne diseases. We can't ever just focus on Lyme disease, but realize that Lyme disease is 80% of the tick-borne diseases. And somewhere, who knows, between 20 and 40% of people who are infected with this disease will end up with chronic debilitating illness. So if that is not a reason to look further and fund research, I really, I don't know what would be. And I just want to say moving forward, I really believe that stakeholders, that would be us, the advocates, the patients, and others, family members, communities that are impacted by these diseases need to be part of the equation. So if we're going to develop public policy, please include the stakeholders. Science will lead the way. I have no doubt about that. Science is being driven by patients at this point. So now it's time for the NIH to step up and fund that research too. The science will come up with better approaches to clinical care of Lyme disease patients, as you heard today. So we have new treatment options on the way for the first time forever <laughs> for this particular disease. There are new diagnostics in the works um, that, you know, that, that, that are out there that are published. So it needs to be one big giant triangle. I didn't draw a circle because I couldn't fit it on the table. Let's take some questions. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, do you want to? Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much to the panelists now, and uh, we'll go ahead and, and take some questions. Um, they're already there, okay. Um, the TIC Act is a great start, but we need much more money than what is being proposed. How can we increase funding? Zara. Sure, <laughs> I agree. I think that we need to, like Holly mentioned, in addition to the public health approach that we take in the TIC Act, also work to increase funding at the NIH. And that's something that uh, we, we need to continue to call for. Biomedical research is one of Senator Collins' top priorities. And this year, she's um, worked to increase funding in the Senate Appropriations Bill. It would be a $3 billion boost for the NIH. And uh, a lot of that isn't, it's not uh, designated by disease as it is at the CDC. So we have a strong opportunity with that tremendous boost in funding to ensure that um, a, an appropriate portion goes to tick-borne diseases. So the next question is, how do we help states improve their ability to report tick-borne diseases cases more accurately? And I'll expand that a little bit. Is Explain to us also the role of the CDC as a national level sure. to coordinate surveillance and education at a state level when there's so many different states. Right. Yeah. Great question. So, so states have both the um, authority and the responsibility to report um, what we call nationally notifiable diseases back to the to the U.S. government, um, the CDC. And the way they do that is every state has their own protocol for doing that. It's usually some form of a um, electronic form or a paper form, has some basic information about the specific case. So um, on a regular basis, the Council uh, for State and Territorial Epidemiologists get together and they decide what is nationally notifiable. 
Um, there are 17 nationally notifiable vector-borne diseases, including you know, Zika and chikungunya, and then Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, or lichiosis. You know, it goes on and on, 17. Um, and so all of those um, cases, uh, along with chlamydia and gonorrhea and, and HIV and all the other nationally notifiable diseases, get sent in by healthcare providers to the state. The state collects this information, they collect additional information to, to verify the case, and then they transmit it through um, a system called NEDS back to CDC. We tabulate them and we put out the reports that you see, our case surveillance reports over and over again. Um, we publish them every year. Um, at minimum, um, sometimes even more frequently. You know, I think um, we are in the position at CDC to try to make that process more efficient, but in, at, at the end of the day, and John, you're, you're one of these, these doctors, the responsibility still sits upon the backs of the doctors to report each and, indiv each and every um, individual case, and if they do not, it doesn't make it to the state. If the state doesn't investigate it, it doesn't make it to CDC. Um, so there are a couple areas where we can modernize that process and make it a little easier on folks. Um, I know there are some initiatives to try to utilize electronic health records to try to make that process more efficient, but um, that process also takes some time to adapt to, and there are barriers there. Um, so in the interim, what we are doing is trying to create alternatives for estimation, right? So if we lose Massachusetts, um, in 2018, do you think losing those 8,000 cases that Massachusetts normally reports will show that now we have an even larger number of tick-borne disease cases, or will it go down? Will it stabilize? Will the news reports say, you know, tick-borne disease is stabilized for the first time, right, because we've lost those 8,000 cases? We've got to find alternative ways of communicating, no, um, the patterns continue, unfortunately. Um, and so we're utilizing commercial claims data, um, uh, electronic medical record data, other sources of surveillance data that we can um, contribute to this important, um, still important system, um, but also not rely upon the ever-increasing burden that you guys have in terms of collecting this information, transmitting it to the state, and getting it back over to CDC. The uh, next question is, um, where did it go? Um, what are the top three actionable things we can do when we leave the conference today to move this crisis forward? Holly, you want to take a shot at that? The three actionable things we can do. So, uh, you know, what we need to do as patients and advocates is come together. Dr. Spector said this this morning when he was saying if we could speak with one voice, we would be very loud. So that would be my top suggestion would be for you know, us advocates to, come, to figure out a way to come together uh, so that we can share resources, so that we can share information, and so we can share our voice. Hire a lobbyist, for example. Um, we don't have an organized program of, of lobbying Congress to, to make any changes now. It's sort of left up to individuals to do that. So that would be something you could do would be to go back to your organizations and just say, you know what, let's, let's have a, a, a summit or a conference where we all get together and try to come up with a solution. Um, so that would be the first thing. The other thing I, I'm just going to suggest would be if you got a finger at a phone, you can call your, the, it's easy to find out who your local representatives are. And by the way, New York State, um, just so you know, we don't report actual cases either. The reporting system in New York State is an estimation based on lab test results. For a lab test, that's wrong half the time. So our numbers are, you know, I actually listened to the Department of Health guy tell us that, you know, oh, well, the numbers have stabilized and they're going down. Like, no, <laughs> they're not. But that message decreases the priority that Lyme disease or other diseases would have because you know, in this state, I know that it's, Lyme disease is considered a high incidence, low impact disease still. So we need to elevate that. We need to make it what it is, which is the third most common infectious disease that leaves a significant number of us disabled. So that was two. I don't, that, uh, I can add one more. One more actionable item that I would recommend is actually meeting with your member of Congress or at least the health policy staffer to share your story. Your voices are powerful. And once they hear what you've gone through and know that there is already a potential solution in the works, 
that can really help to move the needle on the Tick Act and even on um, working to ensure that then some of the new funding for NIH can go specifically to Lyme tick and other tick-borne diseases. Next question, how do we establish a network of centers of excellence in the U.S. for Lyme and tick-borne diseases? Well, that's something that's close to my heart, actually. So, you know, how, how do we get, you know, clinical centers of excellence like we have for cancer centers and HIV centers? Right now, we don't have that national infrastructure for, for clinical centers of excellence. So, um, I, I just echo that I think it's crucial because it's the link in the translational research that we want to do. But that's not part of the current act, right? So that would require a different bill, I assume. So the TIC Act would support regional centers of excellence, mm -hmm. which I, there are currently five. Mm -hmm. And I'll let Sue share a little bit more about that. And they do have partner, clinical partnerships as well as um, often they're staffed mm -hmm. by entomologists and work closely with state public health officials as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these centers are um, currently focused, really, they're, they're funded to be collaborations between departments of, of um, or uh, university-based uh, centers of agriculture and, and vets, really, right. the veterinarians. Um, there are some clinical interfaces. Sometimes schools of public health are involved, um, most of the time not. Um, ben Nemzer, I know, is, is working on, you know, trying to address sort of the, the, the broader issue of um, clinical services and these centers of excellence that might take a more clinical focus. Um, which would, it would be separate from um, what CDC has been doing. Um, but I think, you know, I look, I look to their work in that area. Um, and also, um, I think that this is something that we've certainly seen um, some of our clinical partners and federal agencies doing as well. Um, again, um, NIH has um, some um, great stake in the treatment aspects, but so does HRSA in terms of service provision. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think, trying to gather the, um, the motivation for those clinical centers would, would certainly come from congressional uh, funding. They are extremely expensive <laughs> um, and very, very networked. Um, so we'll, we'll look to see um, what the next uh, FACA report recommends in terms of that. That wasn't something that was initially um, recommended in the first report. That's right, that's right. Um, how do we advocate for insurance to be required to pay for patient testing and treatment? That's something that came up on the first FACA group is, you know, the burden placed on patients mm -hmm. for obstacles of care and especially cost of care, um, this side of the room. I will say that's very much in the works and that's why access to care is a critical part of the TIC Act. Mm. Um, but in the meantime, while the TIC Act is moving through the process, I think that you continuing to share your stories is one positive step forward. And um, ultimately, I think that what we need to actually get the coverage that's required, Bill, is a coordinated approach where the uh, vast array of treatments and the recognition that it's not a one size fits all, that there are different treatments that work for different people, when that is recognized nationally, I believe that we'll get a lot closer to better coverage for people who are um, seeking treatment. And I'd also like to add that if this, so the CDC is the authority, is looked at as the authority. And so if you change the language that is, that is available to open the door to other treatment options, because I know insurance companies will say, well, the CDC says that doesn't occur. Right. And I'm talking about persistent Lyme disease. Right. So if that were changed, then that would go a long way to helping us convince the insurance companies. <laughs> so, so I, I completely, um, I completely understand that perspective. I've heard it a lot. Um, I, I completely understand it. Um, I will say there have been several changes to the CDC's website over the past few months, including changing our PTLDS page to make sure that you're welcome um, <laughs> to um, to include recognition of persistence. And let me say, you know. Um, that it is very well held um, within our division at, at CDC that Lyme disease persists, that it, it can persist for at least 10 to 20% of patients, um, and that this persistence is really important and that there are no proven treatments. And we're working hard to try to figure out, um, you know, where can we ensure that the language that is needed 
is present so that insurance companies do not unduly put burden on statements that perhaps do not exist anywhere on our website or in written word. Um, and there have been a couple times recently where um, parents of young children actually have come to me and said, you know, the insurance company sent me this letter, right, saying that they would not pay because CDC says this and I turn around and send them the web page back saying, we do not say that. Um, so um, I would invite you all to, um, to help me <laughs> help you in terms of continue to, to, um, to look and to reach out to me if you have questions. I am happy to take your questions. Um, and if you're getting pushback from a specific physician, for example, someone who tells you there's no Lyme disease in, in Colorado, well, have you ever traveled? You know, um, that's pretty much the only question you need to ask for a doctor to then test you um, for a tick-borne disease. Um, you know, we travel here in the United States. It's, it's a wonderful thing, and, and unfortunately, that opens us up to lots of risks. And so sometimes it's just having someone, anyone from CDC, um, suggest that perhaps there is a reason to be tested for something else. If that will help you, you know, please do reach out for, to us. Um, we don't want um, the agency to be a barrier to you getting good care. So we're going to finish up. I'm just going to thank the panelists uh, because you know this is obviously what we love to see is people coming together and have the courage to come together and share. And, and this was a great example of how we can move forward. So I really thank everyone and uh, appreciate your time here. Thanks. Thank you, John.